Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. As you may know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the months of April, May, and June of 2013. This is uh, number eight in that series, entitled Major Lessons from Minor Prophets, and this lesson is itself entitled Trusting God's Goodness. It's a discussion of the little tiny book of Habakkuk. It's lesson number eight in our series for May 25 of 2013. We would like you to grab your Bibles and study the book of Habakkuk with us. We'd also like to let you know that on our website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you will find these materials uh, well in advance of the time for having your Sabbath School lesson if you want to use any of our ideas or any of these materials in, in your Sabbath School class. Let's begin by having a word of prayer together. Our wonderful Father, we come as a, as a humble group of students thinking about your word, discussing it together, sharing it with all those who choose to listen or, or watch. May each one of us be blessed by what we, we discover in this small book, a book that's all about faith. And may we gather more of that as we study together as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Job, we talk about a lot. Job is a key book to describe in some cases, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, why the righteous suffer. Now, most righteous who suffer don't suffer because of the same reasons that Job suffered, but it's a book some people use to describe why the righteous suffer. Habakkuk, in contrast, is the key book to describe why the wicked prosper. In neither case do these books give us the complete answer. Job was a pawn in the great controversy. If you don't know what that is, we would really invite you to look at our website. There's a lots of materials about that. Habakkuk was caught up in a desperate time when God had to allow his, the people of the southern kingdom of Judah to suffer, uh, suffer a fate similar to what Israel had suffered about 120 years earlier. There's no one else in the Bible by the name of Habakkuk. We're not even sure what his name meant. It may be derived from a Hebrew word which means to embrace. It's difficult to determine exactly when this book was written. He does not mention any king or any specific event which we can positively identify as dating the book. The fact that he spoke about the Babylonians rising to power suggests that the book was written in the last third of the 7th century BC, sometime between 630 BC and 600 BC. Now, if you remember, that was a time of real turmoil in the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was already gone into Bolivian, oblivion back in 723, 722 BC, 120 years earlier. Those who believe that Habakkuk was complaining, we'll see about his complaints in a moment, about injustices and violence being carried out by the greedy Jewish landlords oppressing their Jewish neighbors and the poor around them, would date the book early in that time period, somewhere around maybe 630 down to 625. During the, uh, dur and that would be during the early years of Josiah, the king's reign. Those who believe that Habakkuk was complaining about the increasing violence carried out by the Babylonians would place the date of Habakkuk near the end of that time period, somewhere around the year 600. Was Habakkuk, was he a priest? Um, does it say what he was? The answer is we don't know. Don't know. There's a hint at the at the, the chapter 3 is a kind of a song. It's a prayer and a song. And some people have read that and said, you know, it sounds like maybe Habakkuk might have had something to do with sing, the, the singers who, who, who worshipped in the temple. Mm -hmm. So maybe he was one of the choristers or part of the choir or something from the temple. Maybe. That's, but it that's doesn't say. pure speculation. Okay. So Habakkuk is unique among prophets. All the other prophets carried messages from God to their audiences, whoever it happened to be. 
In Jonah's case, it was the Ninevites. Most of the rest of the prophets spoke either to the combined nation of Israel in the early days or to the southern or to the northern kingdoms or sometimes to both during their day. Habakkuk, however, speaks on our behalf to God. The book of Habakkuk might be described as a conversation between Habakkuk and God. We would be comfortable with that, wouldn't we? Well, look at Habakkuk 1, 1 to 4 to get a feel of how this all goes down. This is the message that the Lord revealed to the prophet Habakkuk. O oh Lord, how long must I call for help before you listen, before you save us from violence? Why do you make me see such trouble? How can you endure to look on such wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are all around me, and there is fighting and quarreling everywhere. The law is weak and useless, and justice is never done. Evil people get the better of the righteous, and so justice is perverted. Now that's a, that's a pretty serious cry, wouldn't you say? Well, it sounds like a cry of a sincere man who wants justice in a society that is um, anything but. Mm -hmm. So he's maintained his head about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that justice and fair play is a theme over and over and over. It's, um, off, it seems as if it's more a theme that is preached about with these prophets than, I don't know, Im immorality or, or, mm -hmm. or dealing with prostitutes and things like that, even though those often come in. Yeah. But, but justice is, is a theme over and over and over again. But he s seems to be talking about his society. Mm -hmm. Seems to be like he's talking about a Jewish community rather than, uh, rather than the Babylonians who he would refer to as enemies, mm -hmm. as God's enemies, the enemies of Israel. So I, this tends to, to make me think he's talking more about, about Israel then. Well, the first part of the book, what we've read so far and a little bit further along, really sounds like he's complaining about what's going on in Judah itself. The latter part of the book sounds a little bit more like he's complaining about the Babylonians. And maybe he's complaining about both. It's certainly should, possible. Should we interpret when we, last, last week we read about to Micah, mm -hmm. this week it's Habakkuk, uh, mm -hmm. similar themes. Should we interpret that the things, the conditions in, in Israel and Judah among God's people are worse than they are in Assyria, are worse than they are in the surrounding nations? Well, let me, uh, let me just read you a couple of verses that might give us a clue to that. Look at 2 Chronicles 36, and we'll start with verse 15. 2 Chronicles 36, 15 and 16, and these are almost the last verses in the historical books of, of the Old Testament. V very end of, of Chronicles, that is, you know, before the Babylonian captivity. And starting with verse 15, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, had continued to send prophets to warn his people because he wanted to spare them in the temple. But they ridiculed God's messengers, ignoring his words and laughing at his prophets until at last the Lord's anger against his people was so great that there was no escape. In other words, more was required of them. They had the prophets, so God expected more mm -hmm. than the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Syrians. So, That's a uh, scary thought. Yeah, well, it is. It, it, it really well, is. Why would that be a scary thought? Oh, how much we have had, how much we're responsible for. Yeah, no group of people in the history of our world have had more light than we have. Oh, it'd be better what are we be, doing? It'd be better to be a Babylonian. Well, if you're worried about how much you're supposed to live like God, the answer is yes, it would be. The next cool. verse after what you read in Second Chronicles says, So the Lord brought the king of Babylonia to attack them. Mm -hmm. The Lord brought the king of Babylonia to attack them. No, Norm, the way, you, the way you kind of phrased that, it seemed like it's so much of a burden, all this 
wonderful information that one has <laughs> as a Christian. And oh, no, I didn't mean burden at all. I meant to imply a great responsibility. And it should be our greatest joy to be involved in, in, in that responsibility. Well, the first four verses that I read to you there in the book of Habakkuk take, take a traditional form that's known in, in Hebrew as a lament. He said, well, how can I tolerate all this stuff that's going on? Well, look what's fo what follows. Sometimes when people ask for God's response, he's silent. Often people really pleaded for God's answer. I mean, look at Job. How many times did he ask for God to answer him? And God was just silent. But in this case, the Lord responded to Habakkuk's lament. <coughs> and look at the next, uh, from verses 5 to, to 10. Then the Lord said to his people, Keep watching the nations around you, and you will be astonished at what you see. Watch the around, look around you. You'll be astonished at what you see. I am going to do something that you will not believe when you hear about it. I am going to do something you will not believe when you hear about it. I am bringing the Babylonians <coughs> to power, and those fierce, restless people. <coughs> they are marching out across the world to conquer <coughs> other lands. They spread fear and terror, and in their pride, they are a law to themselves. Their horses are faster than leopards, fiercer than hungry wolves. Their horsemen can come riding from distant lands. Their horses paw the ground. They come swooping down like eagles to attack their prey. Their enemies advance in violent conquest, and everyone is terrified as they approach. Their captives are as numerous as grains of sand. They treat kings with contempt and laugh at high officials. No fortress can stop them. They pile up earth against it and capture it. Then they sweep on like the wind and are gone, these men whose power is their God. Now, am I supposed sound? to take comfort from that? <laughs> if I were one of them, would that be comforting? Those yeah. Chaldeans are the enemies up there. Yes, exactly. And God's going to bring them down here? Well, God said that you'd be surprised, didn't he? He was right. He was right, exactly. He's going to bring them down here to save us? Didn't well, say that. So the question that, that leaps <coughs> off the page at me here is uh, uh, verse 6. Yes. I am bringing the Babylonians to power, whose fierce, restless people. Um, what, what, what is God's actual role here? Is, is, is he blessing them with uh, uh, big muscles and sharp spears? Or is, uh, is, is he just not putting up any defense against the evil? I'll, I'll put it or all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. What about that? And this is the question we raised earlier. If God needs to discipline his people, they're not paying any attention to him, how can he do it? What, what tools does God have available to him? Well, if we, if we go back to, to uh, Judges, Judges 2 and 3, um, he says, you misbehave, uh, you reject me, I'll reject you, I'll, I'll, I'll turn my face, I will, I will remove my protecting hand. That's all God has to do. Mm -hmm. Babylonians are coming down on their own. Yes. Uh, they, they've, they've got their own leader. Yes. Uh, well, that, that, well, doesn't God love the Babylonians too? Aren't, aren't they his? Aren't they his? Does he love too? to watch them, watch the Babylonians kill his own people? Well, well. Once in a while, the Jews go off and do that too. Yes. In mm. addition to other nations mm -hmm. that. Uh, God used to discipline his people. He also used famine and uh, hail and it's locusts. It's a little easier to see how God is involved in lots that. Of things fiery like that. serpents. Yeah, fiery serpents in the wilderness that he protected them from. But what about all those other people? Did they ever get disciplined? They sure. just God just sure. where he's only concerned with the Israelites here, but the, the, needs the Babylonians and the Assyrians they. They discipline themselves. Uh, no, the Medes and Persians disciplined them. Yeah, the Babylonians, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, what do you suppose Habakkuk resp Habakkuk's response was? Well, look at look at verses twelve to seventeen. Lord, from the, and this is he was shocked, as we would be, I think. Lord, from the very beginning, you are God. 
I, I'm, I'm not questioning your, your sovereignty or your ability to do something here. You are my God, holy and eternal. Lord, my God and protector. You have chosen the Babylonians and made them so strong that they can punish us? How can you stand these treacherous evil men? Your eyes are too holy to look at evil. And you cannot stand the sight of people doing wrong. So why are you silent while they destroy people who are more righteous than they are? How can you treat people like fish or like a swarm of insects that have no ruler to direct them? The Babylonians catch people with hooks as though they were fish. They drag them off in nets and shout for joy over their catch. They even worship their nets and offer sacrifices to them because their nets provide them with the best of everything. And they are going to use their swords forever and keep on destroying nations without mercy. Wow. Well, that was, that was Habakkuk's response. What would your response have been? Well, probably, you got to be kidding, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what he said. That's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Actually, it reflects some of the questions we were asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Habakkuk yeah. said it a bit more poetically. Yes. It was all pure, pure Hebrew poetry, if you, read, you could read the Hebrew. Well, is it right for, for, and fair for God to do such a thing to punish his own people? Would God ever use the wicked as an instrument to punish the righteous, or maybe more fairly, we should say the less wicked? <laughs> <laughs> he certainly has managed to do that, hasn't he? Well, let's assume that they were less wicked. Uh, At least some of them. It, 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 on the face of it, superficially, it looks like uh, God's uh, really not being very, very fair about things. Mm -hmm. if, if they are really less wicked and he's picking on these uh, very evil Babylonians to, to harass uh, his, his people, it, uh, it, it really does look unfair. But let's consider that um, these people have had the blessings of God since Abraham, mm -hmm. all of his prophets to this date. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did they do with the prophets? Well, they killed most of them. Yeah. You know, they, they, rejected, they rejected God. So, so they were very privileged. And so in that sense, they have acted much worse mm -hmm. than the Babylonians. There you go, scaring me again. <laughs> they have acted worse. Uh, in the context that they had more light, that mm -hmm. they had more information, yes. and they were doing the same thing, that's it. They were acting worse. And then we look at where we are with all the light we've had, it, it, it gets scary in a hurry. So what was Habakkuk's response? I will climb my, Habakkuk 2, the first verse. I will climb my watchtower and wait to see what the Lord will tell me to say and what answer he will give me, give to my complaint. And the Lord gave me this answer. So now he's going to write it down for us. Write down clearly on clay tablets what I reveal to you so that it can be read at a glance. You know, the enemies are attacking. This isn't a time for us to sit down having a, a lengthy Bible study, right? Now, what is he intending to happen with these clay tablets? They, they post them someplace? Yeah. Like a poster? Or yeah. is there a common sure. place where they put these things up? In front of the temple. Mm. Put it in writing because it is not yet time for it to come true. But the time is coming quickly, and what I show you will come true. Did God have any questions about it? <clears throat> it may seem slow in coming, but wait for it. It will certainly take place. Is he trying to assure Habakkuk? Mm -hmm. and, and it will not be delayed. And this is the message. Those who are evil will not survive, but those who are righteous will live because they are faithful to God. Those who are evil will do what? Not survive. Not survive. Is it say the Babylonians will not survive? No, it says those who are evil will not survive. Does it say the Jews will uh, live forever? No. No, it says those who are righteous will live because they are faithful to God. And that particular statement 
has raised a lot of questions in theological minds down through the history. And why is that? We read on that. Hmm? The just shall live by faith. I was, yeah, I want to know how we got past verse 4. <laughs> no, I, that, was, that was verse 4. The just shall live by faith. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Romans one seventeen. Okay, it's Romans one seventeen. It's Galatians three eleven, and it's Hebrews ten thirty seven and thirty eight. Really, especially thirty eight. These are these are key passages, very important passages in the New Testament, and they choose to quote the book of Habakkuk. Little old Habakkuk. Mm -hmm. Now, why do those verses cause so much controversy? Well. Let's, take, a, let's okay. take in a little more history before we yeah. ask that question. Okay. That's a very, very important question, but let's take in a little bit more history. Habakkuk chooses first to say, to explain all the reasons why he doesn't believe that the wicked should prosper. Okay? So that's his, his thing, you know, after what he's just said. Wealth is deceitful. Greedy people are proud and restless. Like death itself, they are never satisfied. That is why they conquer nation after nation for themselves. The conquered people will taunt their conquerors and show, them scorn, show their scorn for them. They will say, you take what isn't yours, but you are doomed. How long will you go on getting rich by forcing your debtors to pay up? But before you know it, you that have conquered others will be in debt yourselves and be forced to pay interest. Enemies will come and make you tremble. They will plunder you. You have plundered the people of many nations, but now those who have survived will plunder you because of the murders you have committed and because of your violence against the people of the world and its cities. You're doomed. You've made your family rich with what you took by violence and have tried to make your own home safe from harm and danger. Now, I'll stop right here a second. Remember, Dennis, the question you raised a little bit, or the question we talked about a little before, does this sound now like he's talking about Babylonians or Jews? Well, I just wanted to, to ask, who's he talking yeah. about? You, uh, but you, but before you know it, but you are doomed. Uh, uh, who is he talking about? Well, that's what I'm asking you. Also, is, is he just talking or is this something that's actually going to happen in the future? Well, I mean, did, did God inspire him? Did he intend for him to write a book? Uh, yes. He told him to write a book. He told to him write to write a, play a book. tablet. Yeah, exactly. So, anyway, but your schemes have brought shame on your family. By destroying many nations, you have only brought ruin on yourself. Now that sounds more like Babylon, doesn't it? Even the stones of the walls cry out against you, and the rafters echo the cry. You are doomed. You founded a city on crime and built it up by murder. The nations you conquered wore themselves out in useless labor, and all they have built goes up in flames. The Lord Almighty has done this, but the earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the seas are full of water. And we're going to come back to that verse. You are doomed. In your fury you humiliated and disgraced your neighbors. You made them stagger as though they were drunk. You in turn will be covered with shame instead of honor. You yourself will drink and stagger. The Lord will make you drink your own cup of punishment and your honor will be turned to disgrace. You have cut down the force of Lebanon, now you will be cut down. You killed its animals, now animals will terrify you. This will happen because of the murders you have committed and because of your violence against the people of the world and its cities. What's the use of an idol? He concludes. It is only something that a human being has made, and it tells you nothing but lies. What good does it do for its maker to trust it? A god that can't even talk. You are doomed. You say to a piece of wood, wake up, or to a block of stone, get up. Can an idol reveal anything to you? It may be covered with silver and gold, but there's no life in it. By contrast, he could have said, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let everyone on earth be silent in his presence. That's a pretty stark contrast, isn't it? Well, I'm confused. I mean, he's... He's talking about idols now, or maybe he's thinking about, uh, about Babylon. He seems to be <coughs> obsessing uh, over this revelation that uh, Babylon's going to come and, and uh, discipline Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's, he's obsessing on that, and he's thinking about how evil they are and, 
uh, and so forth. So he, he writes this all down and then jumps to idols. Uh, mm -hmm. I, well, he, 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 I think he's trying to explain how things got to be as bad as they are. L maybe so, so, so are these paragraphs then describing Israel rather than Babylon? Well, at least that's a possibility. I mean, he's looking out and he's seeing every, everywhere he looks, what are people worshiping? They're worshiping various idols. Right? At this point in time, could he have been talking to both? Would the message have been the same? Yeah, probably. Are they still taking sacrifices to the temple? Well, that's a good question. Apparently, some still were. And it's very likely that many of them were going to the temple on the weekend, to God's temple on the weekend, pretending to worship there. And during the week, they were doing whatever they want with the fertility cult gods and so forth and on, in the shady trees at the top of the hills. And making <clears throat> sacrifices or contributing their personal resources to these exactly. other things, which would certainly be starving the temple and the priests sure. and, and so on and so forth. They were, they were being friendly to their religious um, neighbors. Friendly. Okay. <laughs> they, they were saying, let's all get together and... Well, they, got, they did more than just get together. This was, <laughs> these were fertility cult affairs. Maybe he was thinking about uh, Psalm 115, verse 8, yes? It probably was an ecumenical movement, though. That's what, what I was thinking. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah. Maybe he was thinking about Psalm 115, verse 8, which says, May all who made them and who trust in them, talking about idols, and you need to read the first eight verses to really get the full picture, may they become like the idols they have made. And, you know, he's just saying, you know, their idols are worthless and they become worthless themselves. There's a lot of that in scripture, actually. Uh, now, was Habakkuk accepted? Was he listened to? Was he admired? Was he persecuted? Well, let me read one more passage just to okay. get us a sort of a picture of the full length of the book. And then we'll start discussing the details. Okay. And he concludes with these verses. Even though, now, now think about who, who Habakkuk is. We don't know exactly what his profession was, but in Israel in those days, what did most of the people do? Farming. They were farming. Where did their living come from? Crops and cattle. Crops and cattle and sheep and goats, what they could grow on their own property, right? Now he says, even though the fig trees have no fruit and no grapes grow on the vines, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no corn, even though the sheep all die and the cattle stalls are empty, I will still be joyful and glad because the Lord God is my Savior. The Sovereign Lord gives me strength. He makes me sure-footed as a deer and keeps me safe on the mountains. Do you think you could rejoice in God under those circumstances if you are a subsistence, farm, subsistence farmer? He was basically taking Job's position, what Job's position, wasn't he? Yeah. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Yeah. And maybe God was feeding him in the wilderness and... Um, Possibly. Maybe. Well, let's look briefly at the historical background for Habakkuk, mm -hmm. but well, at least what we do know. There were several prophets alive and active in Habakkuk's day. Nahum was most, most likely prophesied between 650 and 60, 612 B.C. Zephaniah, we haven't talked about Nahum and Zephaniah yet. Zephaniah between 640 and 620 B.C. Those will be coming up next, actually. Jeremiah from 627 to 575 B.C. Habakkuk prophesied between 630 and 600 B.C. Daniel was taken captive in 605 B.C. and continued to prophesy until probably 536 B.C. Ezekiel began to write in 593 B.C. and wrote through at least 571 B.C. He was likely taken captive in the conquest of Jerusalem, which, appeared, which happened in 598-597 B.C. Obadiah probably prophesied between 590 and 580, 580 B.C. As you can see, this was a very active prophetic time. And why do you think that was so? Was God doing the shaking? He was doing everything he possibly could to shake people up and, and get them to pay attention. I mean, what do you do? I mean, you're, people are about going to captivity and all that kind of stuff, and 
you, you'd like to get some kind of a response, right? Should well, the, we make a comparison to today? Go ahead. Or contrast? Okay. We have had maybe one prophet in close to 2,000 years. Yes. Does that mean that we're good since Israel and Judah had all these prophets in just a few years? Well, let me make, let me make a, a, a different contrast or a different comparison. How well did they respond to their prophets? <coughs> How well have we responded to our prophets? I'll, you, I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer that for yourself. Well, we have the cumulative benefit. Yes. We have Habakkuk and Micah and the others, the, the major prophets. We have all those prophets. Mm -hmm. But not only do we have their books, we have the history that followed them. Mm -hmm. We saw those prophecies, those warnings come true. Mm -hmm. So if we ignore if we disregard those warnings, uh, we, we've asked for, we've asked for trouble. We, we, we can see what happened. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and Jesus said that if you wouldn't believe the prophets, and if somebody was raised from the dead, you wouldn't believe them either. Yeah. Think and he'd say happened. the think he'd say the same thing to us. Well, we didn't raise raise anybody from the dead, so. So are you we saying? didn't. I'm saying <laughs> if somebody else came and raised somebody from the dead, we wouldn't believe it anyway. I think I hear you saying that we not only have prophets from the last few years, maybe, but all of the prophets of the Old Testament yes. and New Testament yes. precisely. that are directly available to us. So we are even more culpable, shall I say, exactly. more, have more light, right. more advantage. Exactly. We have more messages to us. No group of people in the history of our world have more light than we have. Well, you know, today's prophets <clears throat> probably have a different role. Today's prophets are to bring us to mind the old prophets and like Ellen White and just put all that in a package and start saying this is the history. And people who are preaching that accurately, I think, are today's prophets. They are um, well, properly representing the past. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at the amount of material we have available to us, not only from the Bible, but if we take all the writings of Ellen White, I mean, there is so much. I mean, how many of us have read everything, that, even read once everything that Ellen White has written? I'm taking that on as a kind of product, project. Uh, I've read a lot of it, but I haven't read all of it. And what are we doing with it when we learn about it? Yeah. It scares us. Mm -hmm. I guess it was it's supposed to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But not into trying to do something for, to, to make some points someplace, but it ought to scare us enough so that we can run to Jesus and put our, depend, our, our, our trust there and our hopes there and our belief there and not on the stuff that we do every day to keep us going. And, and to say... What should I do yeah. with my life and my hands in my small way? What should I do? Precisely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If, if we really love our neighbor and we really believe these messages that, uh, that uh, Habakkuk uh, wrote uh, back then, you know, he was trying to warn them that the Babylonians are coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, our message is similar. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. The Lord is coming. That's right. uh, if you are not prepared, you will be destroyed. If we love our neighbors, wh why are we not telling them that message? Yeah, exactly. It's a great question. Well, in this time that we're talking about here, who was ruling in the southern kingdom now of Judah? From 697 to 642 BC, the most wicked king, of all time um, among Jews ruled a man by the name of Manasseh. This is the guy who stuffed the, prophet, the elderly prophet Isaiah in a hollow log and sawed him in half. Were they related? Who? Manasseh uh, and Isaiah? Very likely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah was from the royal line. Right. So Maybe uh, an uncle or something yeah, like that. Probably a little further away than yeah. that. But 
And then he was followed by a very wicked son who only ruled a couple of years, Ammon. And then Josiah. Unfortunately, Josiah, remember what happened in Josiah's day? It was a big reformation. He was going on pretty much wickedly with his father and grandfather until the, he, he decided that they needed to at least clean up things around the temple. And as they were cleaning up things around the temple, they found a copy probably of the book of Deuteronomy. May have been all the books of Moses, but it, it probably at least the book of Deuteronomy. And someone said, you know, we probably ought to read this to the king. And it made a difference to him. Yes, it did. It made a huge difference to him. He said, we got to clear. And he started reforming not just the southern kingdom of Judah. He started sending envoys into what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel, now the Samaritan territories, trying to do something with those people. So is that what we should do? Is we should um, read Deuteronomy to, uh, I don't know, Governor Jerry Brown? What? Norm is... <laughs> if you get a Norm, chance, please do. Norm is, Norm is kind of intimating here about, uh, you know, we, we should do something. What, what is it we're supposed to do? Well, I sent the, uh, the great controversy to the Wall Street Journal editor, so... <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, there were two other... There are three other kings that we need to mention. Jehoahaz... Ruled for only three months. He got stuck in there just briefly and he was gone almost immediately. Jehoiakim ruled from 609 to 598. Jehoiachin reigned only three months and ten days in 598 to 597. And that's as far as we really probably need to take the story. There's an interesting little note, historical note here, that's of interest to Bible scholars. The book of Habakkuk we are pretty sure is exactly the way Habakkuk wrote it. How do we know? Well, there, in the dead, among the, the scrolls were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls there in 1947, there was a, a targum. Uh, a targum is a, a short book, that, a short scroll, which has, in most cases, a portion of scripture and then an explanation, a commentary on that scripture, and then another little portion of scripture and a commentary. And this particular scroll has the first two chapters of Habakkuk and commentary. So because it has the copies of the first two chapters of Habakkuk, we can compare that with the Habakkuk that we have, that our copies were a thousand years later at that point in time. And it was all, I mean, there's almost no difference. There's two or three tiny little differences between the two. So we can be reasonably sure that when we read Habakkuk, at least, we're reading the same Habakkuk that Jesus read, the Habakkuk that was there a hundred years at least before Christ. Well, now, let's start bringing some application here. In our day, when disaster happens, people often raise the question, why does God allow so many evil things to happen? And there are several questions, I'm sorry, several answers to that question. One, people bring evil on themselves reaping the results of what they have sown. That's probably the most common cause of evil. Eat, Two, eat too much sugar and you might get diabetes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two, people are in the wrong place at the wrong time and suffer the results of someone else's evil. All the people who went to work at the top of the Trade Center in, on, on September 11, back in 2001, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and some evil people did them in. Okay? Three, some people suffer just because we are so far removed from the tree of life that hereditary and lifestyle, hereditary and lifestyles over the ages have produced many diseases and infirmities and weaknesses and so forth. And people are suffering just because of where we are in history. Four, as we approach the end of this earth's history, God is gradually withdrawing his spirit from this world and allowing Satan to have more and more control. Satan has always wanted to have control of this earth. He claims to be our prince. And so God will allow him to have a certain amount of control so that he can demonstrate in the larger setting of the great controversy what it will be like if Satan were put in charge permanently. So this would be more like a Job experience. Yes. Yeah. And five, finally, occasionally, as in the case of Job, people suffer because they are pawns on the stage of the great controversy. 
You know, today you can almost feel God floating <coughs> and going back from the world. It just seems to be, in my lifetime, I don't think uh, things have changed as dramatically for the worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In four, you almost, uh, you, you, you swerve into uh, answer that, uh, that I would, would offer for for the explanation why there is so much pain and suffering in this world. And I would go back to, uh, I would go back to Genesis, mm -hmm. go back to the, the conversation that went on in the tree. That, that Jesus is a suggestion. That, that Eve and most of the rest of us ever since have placed our allegiance with Satan, that we have followed and done his bidding mm -hmm. rather than that of God. And so we have placed ourselves um, in, in, on the firing line, you know, in, in harm's way. And so, it's, uh, so we should really uh, not be surprised when, when evil comes our way uh, if we, you know, fo follow, follow, follow Satan. Uh, in light of that, I would like to remind you of James chapter 1 the little book at the end of the New Testament, James chapter 1, starting with verse 13. If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, this temptation comes from God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. <clears throat> then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So I have, I may have some control over that, in that I can corral my evil desires somehow, some way, using whatever power might be available to me, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the other evil, where God is withdrawing and permitting Satan mm -hmm. to come in and have more pleasure with us, I suppose you might say. I don't have any control over that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all right if I suffer from, remember my first point? It's all right if we suffer a consequence of their, our own evil behaviors, but it's not all right if I suffer the consequences of somebody else's evil behavior? Well, but Satan is not just somebody else. He's, he's got He's, his is a little, it's a little different circumstance. It's more like the Job thing. But, okay. but to the person who, who asks this question superficially, that doesn't get you off the hook. Because their idea is, if God is all-powerful and all-loving and all-merciful, how can he let a guy get up in a, in a school and shoot innocent children? Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about why people do nasty things. But that doesn't explain why the innocent people suffer because of what those guys did. Well, I've, I, have, I have explanations for those kinds of things and, as, you know, why evil afflicts us all. And most of it, it's, it's our own fault. And I've got some reasons for that. But, you know, the Bible s says a lot of Psalms and here in Habakkuk and other places that, you know, I'm going to take care of you. I can take care of you. It doesn't make any difference how bad things are, how big your enemies are, and so forth. I'm I, the 23rd Psalm, you know. I, I can protect you. And yet, somehow that doesn't seem to happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, so I, don't, the, I don't know how to, how to, how do we respond to people, how to re, even to my own question. Uh, God says he's going to take care of me and protect me from all my enemies, and yet... Um, okay, Here, here's, here's the answer to that in my, in my humble thinking. We can't see beyond the end of our nose. We're worried about what's going to happen the next minute, the next hour, the next day or two, in the next two or three years. That's what we see. God says, I see for eternity. I want you to enlarge your view. Take the bigger, longer haul. Uh, <coughs> would you, one, one student that was in uh, this book by book class with Dr. Maxwell many years ago, listened to all this and thought about it for a while. He said, well, he said, if God could use me to checkmate the devil, I would be very happy. 
as a pawn, use me as a pawn to checkmate the devil, I would be very happy. Mm. And I think if we, th if we could expand our vision a little bit, we would be way ahead in trying to understand these things. And the Desire of Ages 606 says, God counts the things that are not as though they were. Mm -hmm. He sees the end from the beginning and beholds the results of his work as though it were now accomplished. Mm -hmm. well, so we should be uh, happy to be God's soldier, God's right. Navy SEAL or whatever. You know that verse you just read, James, mm -hmm. is it? Um, Jesus has, one of the favorite things that I like what Jesus says, he says, Satan has nothing in me. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus developed no sin in him that Satan could grab a hold of to manipulate him. And wouldn't that be wonderful if yeah. we could say, Satan has nothing in me. Yep, very much so. Dennis. Uh, Lee Strobel, in his uh, book, Case for Faith, asked Charles Templeton um, in his interview, was there anything, any one thing that caused you to throw up your Christian, uh, Christian faith? Um, he had been very closely associated with uh, Billy Graham. Um, he said there was. It was a picture. It was a picture in Life magazine of an African woman yeah. in the middle of a drought. a drought holding her dead baby in her arms. And he says, then I realized there, there could not be a loving God who cared. Because what did this woman need? She needed rain. Just rain. Who controls the rain? You don't. I don't. He does. Mm -hmm. But if we put it in the perspective of the great controversy, yeah. um, it's um, there, there are several quotations. You can find find them primarily in uh, the first chapter of Patriarchs and Prophets. Uh, God could employ only such means as were consistent with truth and righteousness. Satan could use what God could not. Um, it was therefore necessary to demonstrate before the inhabitants of heaven and for all the worlds that God's government is just. Um, God could employ, uh, it's the same, same, same paragraph, uh, it was not safe to leave Satan in heaven. It was necessary for God to let Satan's character unfold. Mm -hmm. And therein seems to me to be a plausible, rational explanation for why there is so much yeah. pain and suffering in this world. We, we, we need to keep moving. We've still got a, quite a bit of material to cover. So mm -hmm. I'd like to ask this question. What do you think the beings in the rest of the universe thought as they watched generation after generation going by and things getting progressively worse and worse? Would it be natural for them to say to God, why are you wasting your time with these people? Why don't you just let them go? Remember Hosea 4.17? What does it say? The people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. Wouldn't that be the rational thing to do? And we don't have time to read them now, but on our website there are several quotations from Ellen White that says, the angel said exactly that. God? Turn us well, loose. Yeah. Just give us permission. We'll wipe out those people. You know, the angel said that. Well, is it true that if God really told us what he's doing, we would not believe it? Habakkuk said that. Really? Daniel said in Daniel 9, 19, For your sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. So what, what, what's his rationale why God should do something? Make him look bad. Make him, God needs to stand up for his own name. It's natural for us as egocentric people to, to approach such questions, to take an egocentric approach to such questions. We want to know how it's going to affect us. But in the larger picture, it is God's name and reputation that need to be preserved in all of this. The questions in the great controversy are not about us, Everyone knows that we are sinners. The questions are about God. And how are those questions going to be answered? Desire of Ages 302 says, 
Selfishness prevents us mm -hmm. from beholding God. Only the unselfish heart, the humble and trustful spirit, mm -hmm. shall see God as merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in good and truth. If we don't see that, probably because we got a selfish heart and we're looking through those glasses. Yeah. I would like to take a moment to cover the main verse in Habakkuk, the one that most people know about. That's Habakkuk 2.4. And that's that short expression which comes out in the New Testament as, the just shall live by mm. faith. In the Greek, in Romans 1, it actually says, the just by faith shall live. That's the sequence. So you can't tell whether the by faith goes with the just, the righteous, or whether it goes with shall live. So in the case of Habakkuk, now that we've reviewed his story somewhat, do you think God was telling Habakkuk, you need to live by faith, or was he telling him, you need to be righteous by faith? Pay your money, take your choice. <laughs> okay, but in the context there, it's really Habakkuk saying, I mean, God saying to Habakkuk, you need to trust me. You need to live by faith. Now in Martin Luther's day, it's said that he... Stood up, he, was, he went to Rome one time and he was praying on his knees, climbing up those so-called pilot staircase there in Rome. And somewhere about halfway up somewhere there, supposedly he thought of this verse in Romans. He was thinking about the Romans version. And he got up, he said, the just shall live by faith. He got up and he walked down the stairs and people say that was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. To, to Martin Luther at that point in time, it almost certainly meant God is willing to forgive me of my sins and not hold them against me because of my faith. Therefore, he won't have to punish me. That's what it meant to Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. And in other words, on Martin Luther's thing, it was, I can become righteous. I mean, God can look at me as righteous because of my faith. That was his emphasis. Another way the verse has been understood is as follows. If one is justified or declared righteous, then he is legally qualified to live eternally in heaven because of his faith. I remember one theologian who came to visit us at Loma Linda. He said, when I get to heaven, if there's any question about whether I belong there, I will show God my right to be there. That's, that's what, so, the way some people take this verse. There's a third way to look at this phrase, and it is to look back at the original context and consider what is the most natural meaning in that context. God was saying to Habakkuk that things looked really bad. But if Habakkuk was a friend of God, he would be willing to trust God and wait. God asks us to allow him to work with us to transform our lives. We must be willing to trust him enough to be willing to do it in the way and at the time he sees best. Thus, the original Greek expression, Romans 1.17, righteousness or salvation by faith could be translated God can and will save and heal. Remember salvation, the word there, it can be, in Greek, it can be either saving or healing, all who trust him. Let me say that again. God can and will save and heal all who trust him. Understood in this way, Habakkuk 2 means those who are God's friends because they have been healed and saved by trusting him are willing to continue trusting him and wait through some very difficult circumstances. And that will be true in our day as well. But how do we develop a trust in God? Well, Habakkuk gives us a clue, and that's Habakkuk 2.14. He says, but the earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord, Lord's glory, as the seas are full of water. The only way you can learn to trust God is getting to know him better. That is the secret. The only way, you have to get to know God. And if you really, Jesus said to know God is to love him. So it's a matter of getting to know him as a friend. Um, and obviously. And, and you get to know God by? Studying the Bible, praying, spending time with him, and witnessing about him to others. And why is witnessing included there? I will uh, look at Dennis and ask about well, his experience, I, I will tell you about my experience, and that's this. If you have to try to teach it to somebody else, you've got to know it a lot better 
you might think that you understand it perfectly well. And I've had this experience many times. You think you know this perfectly well, and then you try to explain to somebody else, and you go, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, it's often said that a teacher learns more their first year of teaching yeah. than the students learn. Probably true. <laughs> Isaiah, remember he was in this same time period. Repeat I'm sorry, he was earlier. Repeatedly talked about the Jewish people being destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's Isaiah 1, 3, 5, 12, and 13. Is that and also lack Hosea. of knowledge about God? Yes. It is clear here in Isaiah 11, 9 that the essential knowledge is oh. the knowledge about God. Certainly Habakkuk was hoping that such a time would come as soon as possible, but he must have recognized that it was not happening in his day. So what do we need to know about God? Did the prophets seem to have a clear understanding. We, we read that verse from Psalm 115. If you read Isaiah 44 verses 9 to 20 and 1 Kings 18, 25 to 29, they just ridicule idols, you know. They, they have to be propped up even to stand, you know. Romans 1 talks about some of that same kind of stuff. Habakkuk 2:18 and 19. The logic of these arguments is compelling, but unfortunately those who worship idols are not inclined to spend a lot of time thinking through the implications of what they're doing. This is an example of a type of behavior which is all too common and even in our day. When someone wants to believe something, he is very inclined to believe it even if essentially all the evidence is against it. Why do people smoke? Why do people ignore the many clear commands in the scripture to keep the Sabbath holy? In, the, in, the, in this case, it is likely that the attractiveness of the promiscuous sexual orgies that were regarded as part of the worship of idols drew people even when it was clear that they were not gods at all. So what have we learned from the book of Habakkuk? Is God losing control? Well, God challenges us to think about what we believe, about what the consequences are of our belief are going to be. Do you think Moloch ever challenged his people to think? Did Dagon challenge his people to think? These are chunks of metal or chunks of nothing. So when things really look bad, we need to look up and say, we will trust God even when things look really, really bad. And that was a back experience. And at the end of his book, chapter 3, you need to read it, he trusted God.